As 6.30 on the nose, so we'll call ourselves to order. If you'd join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Eva Henry. Steve Odoricio. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Paganello. Here. Robin Kniech. Kevin Flynn. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Libby Zabo. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Vidham. Here. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Here. Ann Justin. Here. Lynn Baca. Rex Bell. Tara Radloff. Jeff Blue. George Teal. Jason Bauer. Doris Trular. Here. Laura Crispin. Earl Holan. Richard Champion. Gail Christie. Rick Teeter. Here. Debbie Nasta. Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Saoirse Karras Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, Present. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Phil Sernanek. Present. Wynn Shaw. Present. John Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Present. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Kyle Mullica. Jordan Sowers. John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle. Here. Rita Dozal. Here. Heidi Williams. Eric Montoya. Herb Atchison. Here. Joyce J. Yes. Here. Adam Zarin. Deborah Perkins Smith, <laughs> Bill Van Meter, Here. and we have a quorum. Okay, we do have a quorum. So we need a motion on the approval. Yes. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Have a motion and a second discussion. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstentions. Report of the chair. Uh, first of all, report on uh, RTC. Who's, who's is that one? That would be you, but we didn't have a meeting. We didn't have a meeting yesterday morning. <laughs> That's why I didn't remember it. <laughs> Whew. Look at the time. It's getting late. <laughs> uh, P&E. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have the board collaborative assessment coming out tomorrow. I want to remind everyone to please take the time and fill that out. We'll have that open from tomorrow morning. You'll get an email till about, I think it's June 1. We're going to say June 1. They said June 2nd, but I think that's midnight, and there's an argument if that's the first or second. So let's go with the first for right now and uh, get, get that in. If not, I will be calling you or emailing you to remind you to do it. We'd like to get as much participation as possible. The other thing I will go ahead and bring up from our subcommittee, um, today we did uh, choose a firm to uh, look for a new executive director. Um, the firm was narrowed down but not disclosed yet because we haven't notified them, so uh, by next meeting we'll share more information around that. Um, I do want to applaud the subcommittee that Herb uh, chaired. They started with uh, nine um, companies, narrowed it down four, and then down to three, and then down to one after several interviews uh, with those companies. Um, we're hoping to have uh, the formal notice in the next few days, if not by next week, and that they begin next week would be nice. Um, Herb will report back to us uh, on that progress. The the program will take about 16 to 20 weeks to complete. That's from basically from the start, hopefully next week, 
all the way to hiring an executive director. Um, and I think that's all I have, Mr. Okay. Chair. Anything else? Thank you very much. Any questions? All right, Director Dyack, Finance and Budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, at uh, Finance and Budget, we um, had a contract extension for the Veterans Direct Program with vendor GT uh, Independence. Uh, we had a uh, we executed a contract with Colorado Health Foundation for a hundred thousand dollar grant for a case management pilot program. Very robust discussion and very uh, very promising. Uh, for us to actually get uh, diversify our our revenue streams at the AAA level, uh, we also uh, had informational items, uh, application for a CDOT trans related grant, and we had uh, a building lease update. And uh, the update is there isn't uh, a lot of progress. We're, we're going out and seeing a looking at a couple other buildings other than these two, other than this building, uh, but uh, it, we're just looking, and uh, nothing is moving forward at this point in time. Is that fair? Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, um, I had one item this evening, and it's kind of a, a personal note. Um, so the city of Aurora, for the third year in a row, uh, applied for consideration for the National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation. And in the category of cities from 300,000 to 600,000, uh, there were about 15 cities that participated, and for the third year in a row, Aurora won. So, now when they they have uh, six categories, and there's a one one winner per category, and of those, then they choose they they give out certain prizes, and then they choose one of the cities to be the recipient of a brand new Prius. And it's by random drawing of the people who pledge to uh, support the program. And the last two years, a citizen of Aurora has won the Prius. So that was just a little bonus for, for one of our folks. And that, um, it's, it's, in, it's in the back of my truck. <laughs> Removed for emergencies. <laughs> Um, and that's all I have. Report to the executive director. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, few things. Um, first, upcoming meetings. Um, we are canceling the June board as well as the June Finance and Budget Committee meetings. Uh, there's a um, running conflict with, uh, with CML's annual conference, so you're welcome. Uh, we, however, we will be having um, the, uh, the work, session, work session as scheduled on June 7th, as well as uh, the Performance and Engagement Committee. If, if, in, if indeed we need a meeting for, for performance and engagement. So just keep those on your calendars, but you're more than, more, more than welcome to uh, remove the June Board and the June Finance and Budget Committees. Also, uh, the June RTC meeting will more than likely be, uh, be canceled as well. Dr. Cog Award celebrations. Uh, on April 26th, it was a tremendous turnout. We have 400 plus there. I hope everybody had a good time. With, uh, those in attendance, I see some head nods, so I think that's great. Um, yeah, I, I, we actually finished ahead of schedule, which is, you know, never the case for these events, which was a, which is a nice bonus. Um, Amelia Earhart, she she emceed it again this year, and she did a, a fabulous job as she always does. And Chairman Killed, he did a great job. The best best part of the night, or best line of the night, was uh, I had some opening remarks, and I don't know if you know Amelia, but she's fairly tall. She's much taller than I am, and so she gets back up to the mic. And she says, uh, excuse me, I have to adjust the mic. And she turned it up, and she made a few other comments real quick, and she introduced Bob. So when Bob gets up there, she goes, he goes, I have to adjust the mic. Excuse me, I have to adjust the mic. <laughs> I thought it was great. But when, when she did that, when she did it to me, I looked over at Bob, and Bob said, I got it, I got it. <laughs> no, so that was great. That was great. It was a good event. So, but if you do have any suggestions on how we might improve to make that event better, um, please just let myself or, or Steve Erickson, our communications director, know. We'd be happy to uh, get your input because, as you know, we're always looking to improve. So uh, please, please uh, share any, any input you might have. A uh, few things, handouts at the table today. Uh, the first is the 2017 board workshop. Uh, we have a save the date flyer for, for you all today. It's going to be held on August 25th and 26th down in Colorado Springs. 
Uh, the full agenda will be published soon. Uh, the P&E is finalizing that. We had, a, we had a good discussion about it today, so that should be coming out uh, uh, shortly. Bike to Work Day is June 28th. Registration is open. Um, and just Steve gave me a few few tips for board directors to help make us this uh, help make this succeed this year. Um, we would really request that you guys uh, register and and, um, and make certain your city, town, and county has a, has a team. Um, I, I don't know how many we had last year, Steve, from local governments, but we had quite a few teams that were established from our community. So we would encourage you to do that. Order your free T-shirt. We have the table set out. If you haven't done that already, please do so. Um, and if you do indeed ride, we would ask that you um, thank the station, organize, station organizers on Bike to Work Day. It's a pretty big endeavor, and we, we really appreciate all the effort that they go through. So it would, I think that would, it, would, um, it would be a, a ray of sunshine if you all did that and, uh, and express your gratitude. Um, and any, any social media contacts or any opportunities you see to, to promote the event uh, within your communities, we would appreciate as well. Next is a Small Communities Forum, um, which is going to be held on June 29th. Uh, registration is now open, so I would encourage you to, if you're interested in this event, please do so. This is the second of its kind that we've had, and um, uh, the last one I think went over extremely well. The topics this time are intergovernmental co collaboration and affordable housing, so uh, please register for that. Transportation Short Course uh, is scheduled for June 7th, immediate immediately before the board work session. Um, so please, uh, if you're interested in that, please register. And, uh, just contact Connie and she'll, she'll get you all signed up. Um, just a little internal staffing uh, exercise that we went through. Um, over the last month, Dr. Cog's staff, the divisions have, been, have completed a one-day leadership and team development workshop with Dr. Carl Larson, who's a, an expert in leadership teamwork and, and collaboration. We're very lucky to have Dr. Dr. Larson uh, be located within the uh, the Denver region. Um, he's a personal friend and mentor of our own Jerry Church, or Jerry Church, Jerry Stiegel, and um, and uh, he uh, and you know what I, I will say the the uh, the comments that I've received from staff I think they were very appreciative of that and has really helped with uh, some collaboration and teamwork amongst our amongst our divisions and across divisions. So I just wanted to uh, I wanted to mention that some of the work that we're doing internally. Couple upcoming events. Um, Friday, uh, there's an inclusive communities, a solutions forum for housing, which is being hosted by the city and county of Denver. Dr. Cog was uh, was on part of that working that planning team, um, and uh, I know my understanding registration is closed. However, there are some late uh, registration possibilities, and I'm sure I'm sure Chrissy might be able to might be able to. Uh, make something happen. Yeah, twist some arms if, uh, if anybody's interested in attending that. Um, we, Dr. Cog, we're hosting an affordable housing, affordable senior housing developers focus group next week, Thursday, May 25th, here in this room. Um, the intent is to bring together developers, developers and um, um, uh, you know, funders and providers of, of senior care services. Um, to discuss the obstacles to senior affordable housing. So you're more than welcome to attend that as well. And last but not least, I would like to recognize uh, Grayson Solander. Uh, he's a junior um, at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, he'll, be, he's, he'll be interning at uh, Greenwood Village this summer. I had, I had an opportunity to meet him and talk to some uh, earlier today. He's a tremendous young man, and we wish him all the best, and I'm sure the mayor will take great care of him at the, in Greenwood Village. So with that, I am done, Mr. Chairman. Boy, I'm tempted to make a comment about the No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> so agenda item seven is public comment. We do have up to 45 minutes allocated for public comment. Each speaker will be allotted three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the board meeting to complete the public comment. We do request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have anyone here this evening that would like to address the board? Seeing nobody. 
We will move on to the consent agenda. Under attachment A are the minutes from the last meeting. If there are no comments or questions or corrections, they will be entered. Mo motion to approve in a second. Uh, Elise. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? One abstention. Okay, agenda item eight, which is attachment B. Let me get there. This is the nominating committee's uh, report, so I'll turn it over to uh, Director Rakowski. We were the committee, uh, which was comprised of Commissioner Jones from Boulder County, George Teal from Castle Rock, Robin Kanish from Denver, Commissioner Partridge from Douglas County, myself and Shakti from Lakewood met to uh, consider appointments. The candidates proposed below are recommended unanimously by the nominating committee members. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's a, a great group. So with that, I would ask uh, for you, my, Mr. Chair, to take a motion on the appointment. Do I hear a motion? Second? Second. Have a motion and a, se a second discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. Informational briefings. We have uh, under agenda item 10, attachment C, Mr. Erickson is going to talk to us about the Way to Go program. Well, you know. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome everyone. My name is Steve Erickson. For those of you that I, I haven't met, I'm the Communications and Marketing Director here at Dr. Cog, and one of the things I do is uh, oversee the Way to Go program, which is a regional transportation demand management program, and I'll get to that in just a second. And, and make that whole regional transportation demand management thing a little more understandable for you, I hope. What I want to go through today, just quick overview of, of the program, talk to you about how we work across the region, uh, drill down a little bit, not get into too much detail, but talk a bit about the campaigns, some of the campaigns and outreach that we do. I'll touch a bit on uh, some of the, the trends in the region and some of the results of our program and then just sort of give you a sense of what we're focused on for 2017 and into 2018. So the first thing you need to know about the Way to Go program is it's actually a regional partnership. It's a partnership between Dr. Cog um, and seven transportation management associations in the region. And I'll show you a map on the next slide. Um, those TMAs, uh, we love our acronyms, uh, are sometimes uh, known also as TMOs, transportation management organizations. But we work collaboratively uh, across the region. Uh, it's funded primarily using federal dollars, congestion mitigation, and air quality dollars. I should put an asterisk on that and say that we leverage those federal funds and actually bring in about another uh, roughly $1.3 million um, uh, in funding for our Guaranteed Ride Home program. Again, I'll share a little bit more about what that is, and our Van Pool program. And then I also should, and I'm going to recognize somebody who's really important to this program, uh, Celeste Davis Stragand is our uh, Way to Go Program and Marketing Manager. Celeste, would you just stand up and, and be recognized? She's awesome. Uh, we bring in uh, quite a few dollars in, in terms of sponsorship. So for Bike to Work Day, as an example, I think um, you know, we bring in uh, $40,000 plus just in sponsorships to help uh, pull that event off. The goal of the program is to reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality. Those of you that have been around for a while probably remember the brown cloud in Denver. Um, in a you know, sort of funny roundabout way, that's why we get these dollars, because we have been out of compliance with air quality. And so uh, we, we are kind of charging towards a couple of specific goals that might be familiar to you all, having gone through the MetroVision update uh, specifically. We're charging to uh, reduce single occupant vehicle, there's that, another acronym, SOV trips from 75% to 65% by the year 2040. Uh, the second one we really focus on is reducing vehicle miles traveled per capita. 
by 10 percent by 2040. So those are kind of the two primary goals uh, related to that. Obviously, reduction in greenhouse gases. Again, these are all things that are uh, included in the MetroVision program. So here's that map uh, of the partnership. Uh, up on the upper left, you'll see Boulder Transportation Connections. Uh, uh, running down uh, the, the 36 corridor, uh, most of you, many of you know Audrey DeBarros and, and we work with, it was 36 Commuting Solutions, they've now rebranded to just Commuting Solutions. We work with Karen Stewart at Smart Commute Metro North, sort of that big chunk of blue in the, in the center top. Uh, Northeast Transportation Connection, some of you know Angie Mel Piede. Uh, uh, downtown Denver Partnership. Primarily we're working with Aileen McCallum and uh, Anika Patel over at Downtown Denver Partnership. Uh, Transportation Solutions, uh, Stuart Anderson, and then Denver South TMA. So many of you probably know Steve Klausing and Lauren Macias, that crew. We work cooperatively in this region to reduce traffic congestion. It's important to point out that outside of those blue areas, uh, the way to go, the Dr. Cog way to go team has outreach specialists. So we're doing quite a bit of work uh, these days in Aurora and sort of leaning on our board chair a bit and doing quite a bit of work out west uh, in, in Lakewood, again, to reduce traffic congestion. I said I would try to, you know, sort of demystify this, this acronym, TDM, and this goes by pretty quickly, but I'll play it again. But one of the ways to think about this is just better use of our existing roadway systems to reduce traffic congestion. So this image shows you 200 people in cars, you know, 177 cars, on three buses, on one light rail train and on bikes. So it makes the point that if we can get people shifting to other modes, it's going to be better for all of us. Another way to kind of think about this, and this was the first campaign we ran after we uh, rebranded, was this idea, if we want to keep it really simple, it's stop being an SOV, and that's V as in Victor, um, not V as in something else. Um, Again, you know, keeping it really simple, the way I like to think about this is our main mission is to get people to drive alone less, period. It's all about getting people focused on different commute choices. So what choices do we focus on? Carpooling is obviously one of those. For those of you that have been around a while, you may remember ride arrangers. That actually started at Dr. Cog in the late 1970s as in response to the uh, uh, oil embargo. So we've been forming carpools at Dr. Cog really since the late 70s. Back in the day, it was all done manually. Today, we use um, a platform, a digital platform called My Way to Go to make that happen. Van pooling, how many of you guys have seen Way to Go vans on the roads? Good, a lot of you. Um, so we have about 125. It might be up to 128 of those vans on the roads right now. The sweet spot for van pooling is commutes that are 10 or 15 miles or more and typically five or six people in those vans. So we have a lot of them that come in even from you know, way south down in Colorado Springs into the Federal Center. Um, again, this is, it's, it's a growing part of our business. And I want to point out too, in, in, you know, in terms of regional cooperation, we work very closely with the other two van pool providers in the region with Van Gogh out of Fort Collins. You can find open van pool seats on our platform for, for uh, that van pool service and with Metro out of Colorado Springs. Those are the other two that you probably see on the roadways sometimes. Transit, that's obviously a really important and growing part of what we're promoting and we work very closely with RTD and, and employers to promote uh, uh, the sale, the adoption of, of eco passes and ridership on, on all of the, the lines, including the new lines. Biking, I'll talk a little bit about bike to work day in a minute, um, but again, we've been promoting that for a lot of years. Walking, I think it's important uh, to point out that a lot of people have commutes that involve biking and walking as part of their commute. I might bike to the light rail station, I might walk to the bus stop. Um, we recognize that and we're promoting this in a holistic way. Teleworking, and I really should say this is alternate uh, work schedules, you know, including um, compressed work weeks, those kinds of things. Again, this is something we've been focused on here for a lot of years. I will say that today, this particular area of our efforts is, is somewhat diminished. Um, as most of you probably know, we have a really high percentage of employers that offer telework options here now. There used to be, um, you know, kind of a need for us to go in and, and actually provide technological support for teleworking, but almost every uh, organization of any size sort of has that covered for the most part today. 
And then those are all about work commutes. Um, a really important part of our program is our school pool program, which is nationally recognized. And again, this is all about uh, if those, those of you that have been in and around some of particularly the private or, or non-traditional schools and sort of seen that, that traffic build up um, around drop off and pick up time, this helps alleviate that. And, and I'll share a few more details about that in a, in a subsequent slide. So how do we do what we do? Uh, Dr. Cog and our Way to Go team here manages the advertising agency. So we do advertising campaigns that are about raising awareness. We do advertising campaigns that are directly focused on action, getting people to switch modes, uh, to sign up on our My Way to Go platform, those kinds of things. In terms of bang for the buck, employer outreach is, is a huge part of what we do. Um, our surveys show that if your employer supports commute choice, you're likely to be taking advantage of those commute choices. As a matter of fact, a lot of surveys now are saying, particularly millennials want to work for organizations that are very intentional about offering commute choice. So a lot of what we do is go out, going out and working with, with businesses and organizations in the region. Community outreach uh, is what it says. It's, you know, we're out there at transportation fairs, community fairs, health and wellness fairs. If it's not a, a way to go staffer here at Dr. Cog, it's again, one of our TMA partners. Uh, events and, and outreach campaigns. I'll talk a little about Bike to Work Day and Way to Go Tober. Uh, again, I'm, I've mentioned a couple times, but a really important part of what we do that makes us successful is our mywaytogo.org trip planning platform. So this is a mobile-friendly uh, web-based platform uh, that allows you to put in a destination, put in an origin and a destination, and it gives you all of your options and kind of compares those options uh, in terms of cost and, and trip duration, uh, things like CO2 uh, emissions. And then you're uh, uh, given the opportunity, if you're interested in a carpool or a van pool, to go look for a match on that. It also dr does trip tracking. And we're actually in the process now of, of looking at a, a mobile app that will really help with that trip tracking part of it. But this is a very successful application. We have over 20,000 uh, people registered on that platform right now. Guaranteed ride home program. So I just want to briefly explain what that is. So one of the main things that prevents people from taking transit or jumping into a van pool with five other people is this idea of what happens if I can't get home on my terms if I have an emergency where I'm not feeling well or my child isn't feeling well. So we run a program here, um, completely, uh, basically privately funded, where we actually offer people cab rides home, taxi rides home, if something like that comes up. That's our guaranteed ride home program. And then I just want to say, you know, one of the really key things that we're um, intentional about is integrating way to go and TDM into a lot of different projects uh, and partner initiatives. So one of the ones I know se several of you, uh, Herb and Elise, you guys were up at the, the Commuting Solutions event here a couple of weeks ago, and we were really highlighting the success of what they did along that 36 corridor during construction. And, and our team here at way to go was a part of some of those ad campaigns. Uh, currently, Celeste is working with the National Western folks because of that big project and kind of integrating TDM into what they're doing over at, uh, at National Western. Bike to Work Day, I'll just touch on that if you don't know, because we've been talking about it. It's, it's June 28th. It's always the fourth Wednesday of, of June here in Colorado. That's by state statute. June, the entire month of June is actually bike month. The idea with Bike to Work Day is to introduce people to bicycle commuting in a really safe, supportive, fun environment. So how do we do that? We have roughly 300 uh, breakfast stations. Uh, I heard uh, Doug talk a little bit about uh, sort of that business challenge aspect and, and your communities can get involved in that. We typically have seven to 800 businesses that, that are involved in a, a business challenge. So they're kind of competing against each other, uh, you know, to see who can get the most people uh, participating on Bike to Work Day. Anyways, it's just, of the things that I do at Dr. Cog, this is my favorite event. Um, it's just a wonderful community event overall. And in terms of achieving our goals, it's been really, really successful. Uh, this last year, 37% of the people that participated were first timers. Uh, even better, most of those people said they would uh, be much more likely to continue cycling after the event. So again, it's, it's a really uh, successful regional event for us. 
And then we've been really focused, too, on kind of looking at beyond the day. Um, so we are uh, getting much more involved in Winter Bike to Work Day, which is in, in January. Again, I mentioned Bike Month. We're working with Bike Denver on Bike to Work Wednesdays, and other communities are kind of looking at at that. Uh, Bike Denver actually uses our, our My Way to Go platform um, uh, for registration and tracking on that event. Just a year-round uh, promotion for biking in the region. It is, it does happen to be the fastest growing mode in our region. If you look at the 2000 census and, and the more recent census numbers, this is the mode, maybe not surprisingly to most of you, that is growing the fastest. Just give you a quick uh, sense of, of the Way to Go Tober campaign. So beyond the day-to-day -day of our outreach people and the TMA's outreach people going out and visiting with businesses and promoting commute choice, this is a campaign that we've now done two years in a, in a row that I think will uh, be an ongoing thing, part of our calendar every year, um, where we approach large companies in the region. Uh, we started with 25 the first year, this, la this last year we had 42, we'll have 50 plus in 2017, and we challenge their employees to use optional commute modes or other commute choices, smarter choices, biking, walking, rail, bus, carpools, van pools. To qualify sort of for the tracking on this, you just have to do basically one a week as an employee, and then we, we, we gather all the results, sort of track that throughout, and, and end up with winners at the end of this. So it becomes kind of a nice, friendly competition. And this slide is really just sort of a fun way to present some of the results in infographic format. So um, this, this last year, we had 41,000 smart commutes that were logged. Um, equivalent to 399,000, almost 400,000 smart commute mile, uh, miles traveled, and again, that's just with these 42 companies. So what we know is if we get people trying these things, we will start to see um, uh, success in terms of behavior change. Just talk briefly about School Pool. Again, one of the most successful programs of its kind in the country. Uh, I mentioned this in, in another setting for those of you that know CDOT and the name Bemelin. Uh, the Way to Go program has our own Bemelin. I'm pretty proud of that. It's Mia Bemelin. Um, and she's been managing this program for a lot of years. And she gets calls, I would say, on average about once a month from another um, uh, peer organization in, in North America that wants to know how we do this as well as we do it. So we're using our My Way to Go platform. We built a module on that platform where we're able to load rosters. And again, as I said, with a, uh, a work commute, able to find people not only near where your home might be, but along your route, let's say, to one of these private or, or um, uh, non-traditional schools. I will say, because people have asked this, we also work with some of the, the, the larger public school districts Two, most notably uh, Boulder Valley School District. Um, we've worked with them for, for quite a few years, um, you know, helping them uh, see that shift. Nearly 40% of the people that enroll and look for matches on this system are able to find it. Um, that's just a number I'm, I'm pretty proud of. I mean, it tells us we're being successful in finding those matches. People are also using it uh, for uh, finding walking and biking buddies. And actually, at the high school age, uh, people are able to find transit buddies as well. This just shows you growth uh, from 2011 20, up to 2015, you know, roughly 12,000 up to 18,000. We're actually at close to 19,000 families now. I just did not put the 2016 information on here. So let's talk about overall way to go program results. Our goal, again, is to um, improve in those VMT reduction numbers every year. That new VMTR is what we would call it. Um, and we've done that each year for the last six years. Um, we have encouraging data to point to in terms of the American Community Survey. I mentioned biking being the fastest growing mode. Um, Colorado telework penetration, that's where I said we don't have as much to work, as much work to do in that space uh, now because we already have the highest telework penetration in the nation. Um, Denver matches the our state average of about 7% and Boulder is actually, I think it's actually up closer to 11% now, but it's over 10. But there is a yeah but to this. Um, I think most of you know um, congestion is getting worse in our region. Uh, Steve Cook gave a presentation here a few months ago to the board, sort of the congestion report. And this VMT per capita, which had been declining for the longest period really in our history from about 2006 up to 2014, we saw a steady decline in that, sometimes closer to flat, but you know, generally a steady decline. That flattened out and actually the last two years has started to climb back up. 
I think the reasons are probably obvious. Um, gasoline has been inexpensive. We have a really healthy economy where people are taking a lot of trips, whether it's for um, a business or you know just personal trips uh, and freight. And we're seeing, still seeing population and employment growth across the region. So the bottom line on this slide, the takeaway is we have our work cut out for us. There's still an awful lot of work to do. So our focus is um, enhancing our, our multimodal trip planning platform. That's the My Way to Go platform. We've actually been exploring for a couple of years integration with some of the other platforms out there. Go Denver, that's very much um, in, in flux right now, but we continue to talk to developers and you know, ultimately we're driving towards um, what I've been calling this holy grail of trip applications for a lot of years where I would not only be able to plan my trip, but I would be able to reserve a bike share or reserve a car share or buy my RTD ticket, those kinds of things. So there, uh, there's a group of us that are kind of talking about that. I'm excited about what mobility choice might, might mean um, for this you know, in the long term, but we're definitely working towards constant improvement there. Also looking at uh, sort of how we leverage some of the shared use mobility and, and uh, ride hailing platforms and I think our approach is where it makes sense we're, we're pursuing some of those opportunities. Many of you know about the uh, the Centennial pilot with Lyft. Um, we're working on a pilot right now with Uber along the 36 corridor but there's also a lot of questions about whether or not those ride hailing services actually reduce congestion or not. I mean those are cars that are out there a lot of the times with just a driver waiting um, you know, for a fare. So again, we're looking at that and I think, you know, kind of approaching it with some, some caution and just where it makes sense. In terms of car share, I really just put that on here because um, our van pool provider is being purchased by Enterprise. Um, one of the things we, you know, we think with car share is that might help folks live a car light or a car free in terms of ownership lifestyle. So again, we're looking at opportunities in those areas without a specific plan of action other than with enterprise, you know, uh, to, to use another part of their fleet. Uh, as some of you know, Dr. Cog is developing an active transportation plan. We'll be very involved in that. That'll be primarily focused on biking and walking, those healthy choices. We'll be hosting a TDM summit, Transportation Demand Management Summit. I want to point out that um, many of your jurisdictional folks came down here for an FHWA workshop um, probably close to two months ago now and Dr. Cog will kind of be taking the lead from that workshop to um, pull a bunch of the partners together really to start talking about how we can all do better uh, in terms of transportation demand management in the region and then improving results. That's always our bottom line in the way to go program. So this is just almost the last slide. This is just something I wanted to share with you in terms of our partnerships and the importance of those partnerships. Um, about six months before we went to HOV3, uh, we started uh, having discussions with CDOT and HPTE and a bunch of other regional partners about how we could help with this transition. And uh, so it was a, a very a successful, I think, joint uh, campaign to both raise awareness, but also for us it was an opportunity to get people into uh, three-person carpools and into van pools. And this is one of the things we did was we, we wrapped some of our vans that were driving along those two corridors. This was 36 and then North I-25. Um, with this HOV3 uh, message, so it was basically rolling billboards and again, I think very successful in terms of how we work together. So this is it. We could use your help. So we've asked for your help on Bike to Work Day and, uh, and there's a flyer here. I would just say we asked for your help in terms of making us aware of anything going on in your respective jurisdictions where we might be able to come in and, and, and help with transportation demand management. So referrals to businesses that might be moving into the areas, referrals with organizations, affinity organizations that, that we might work with. I think that's it. Director Cernanek. Yes, uh, Steve, thank you for your presentation. A uh, question for you in, and, uh, in looking in the area of, of potential help. Uh, can you help uh, identify those areas where a commuting path by bike uh, is prohibited from using the electric assist bikes that are growing in prominence uh, for folks to be actually using them for commutes? It's a good question. I don't know that I have that information at my fingertips, but we've, we've been talking about this. As a matter of fact, one of our big giveaways for Bike to Work Day this year is, is an e-bike. And I think, you know, our program supports e-bikes and, you know, sort of usage on 
trails and, and paths, but I don't have that information. I'm happy to try to gather that, though. But uh, also in our area of how we can help, if it's a local ordinance that is standing in the way, uh, you can maybe help point us in that direction. I'd be happy to, Phil. Yeah. Mr. Rex? Director Sinanik, I'm I might be able to just lead, give you a little bit more information on that. I know actually there was a bill that we debated here uh, around this table related to that, which did was was signed by the governor that um, provides the opportunity for local governments to uh, through statute to allow or prohibit um, certain electrical vehicles. So um, I'm I'm not sh I'm not sure where everybody is with that and with in regards to local communities, but it's out there and I, I think it's it's now. It's not prohibited. Director Partridge. Steve, thank you very much, sir. Some great innovative ideas to really just help people, you know, just give them a little push. And maybe a little on the lighter side, Mr. Chair, I hope you don't sanction me in this. But uh, So, Steve, a question, you know, on June 28th, if I'm Interim Director Rex and I stay at home that day and ride my stationary bike, does that qualify me for ride to work? <laughs> You? Yes, yes. Please. Uh, Roger. Please answer. Actually, so I have to, I have to share this story because is Brad in the room? Brad, are you here? So we had a contest sort of, you know, just for Dr. Cog employees. And actually, I will say, this dude right here, Doug Rex usually wins the contest at Dr. Cog for the longest ride coming in from Castle Pines down in your neck of the woods. Uh, was it a, a few years ago we, we had asked people to post photos and I believe it was Brad's wife that posted a photo. She works at home. So I think she moved her bike <laughs> from the one room into the other room or something. Do I have that right, Brad? I don't know. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Other Director Joyce. Thank you, Steve. Here we go. Thank you, Steve. That was very, very interesting. You said something in your presentation. You mentioned vehicle miles traveled uh -huh. that had increased and you related it to population growth and I was wondering if is there more vo more vehicle miles traveled because of population growth or is that percentage of of individuals tr traveling more yeah in vehicle and that's a good that, question you wondered that too didn't you uh, it's a good question so um, and the specific um, metric that I was pointing to is actually vehicle miles traveled per capita. So VMTR, you know, the, the region is going to grow from 3 million people to, to 4 million people by 2040. We know vehicle miles traveled are going to go up. There, our goals are to reduce vehicle miles traveled per capita. And again, it had been declining and Which leveled off, but now has gone back up. So again, pointing to inexpensive gasoline and pointing to this healthy economy with just more trips in the region. People are working and, you know, and playing across the region. And even in terms of uh, you know, some of the growth that we see in the area is still, um, I don't want to call it sprawl, but it's spread across the region. It isn't all, despite our density goals, it isn't all, you know, close to where people work. I don't know if I answered your question or not, Joyce. It, it wasn't the answer I'd hoped for. But okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Director Zabel, did you have your hand up? Okay. Other questions or comments? Director Vidim. Thank you. Um, Mike, please. Mike, please. Many of our uh, residents commute into uh, Denver or Aurora, and they're obviously driving almost exclusively in single cars. What what process, how do we let the clutch out, so to speak, to uh, get a, a van pool going, such as uh, way to go? <clears throat> yeah, so the, the best thing initially um, is to get people, and this is, this is something that it requires scale, right? But if, if you have enough people in Bennett that w would register on that My Way to Go platform, you can just, you register on that platform and then it is looking for matches of similar commutes. And it isn't just, it might not be somebody in, in Bennett, it might be somebody on the way in from Bennett, you know, coming east to west that works downtown or that might work in the tech center or, or something like that. So that's the best thing we can do. And then if there are employers there that, that we could work with, we'd, we'd love to know who those folks are. Um, or if there are is sort of, if you know of a cluster of employers, you know, in, in other areas where we could work directly with an employer, we could certainly help in that way too. Other questions or comments? Yes. Yep. All right. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. We will move on to agenda item 11, which is attachment D, and uh, that is Mr. Stiegel.
Good evening. I think we're ahead of time, so I probably should slow down. No. No. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was thinking that was probably right. Okay. This one, uh, this presentation, a little more than a scorecard. This is just the first glance we wanted to give you after the vote in February. So it's a little more than that. I'm going to clip through some of the slides, and then I'm going to spend a little more time in one area, if you will. First thing I'd like to do, though, is just quickly overview. I'm going to pop them in here real quickly, though. Uh, the strategic planning model, particularly, particularly for uh, new board directors. I've left out a couple of pieces that we don't deal with, just so I can clip through it, but we have done mission vision. Uh, Metro Vision has themes and outcomes, which are our main focus areas. Objectives are continuous improvement areas. Performance measures and targets, which is, uh, I was happy to see in Steve's presentation, they're working on a collective approach to that, and I think this will certainly fall into that very well. And then the last, of course, are strategic projects or initiatives, which drive your objectives and outcomes. So this is the model we've worked with and designed a, a MetroVision uh, plan around. We have another scorecard application called Scoreboard. It will house the MetroVision scorecard exclusively. We use a companion application called QuickScore, but that's for our internal scorecard. So it's a software application that allows you to really house all of your objectives and your key performance indicators, measures, and targets in one spot. And once they're updated, we can export from Scoreboard uh, to start reporting on progress. The updates are going to vary a fair amount based on measure frequency. We get it maybe yearly or maybe every other year or, or multiple years go by before we can get any substantive data. When you look at this next screen, very hard to see, but that's the welcome screen. It's already there in the upper right hand. You can't read it, but it says board director. All board directors will have view access to scoreboard. So if you get in there and play around, you can't hurt anything. You can have fun. I see uh, Colleen's applauding. Thank you. I think that was for that last comment because I'm not finished yet. So, okay. Okay. So uh, this slide shows the first page. The, there's going. I'm un developing a user guide for you that will be located on the board portal. The access to this will be located in the board portal. And during a future board meeting, I'll give a short tutorial on how to navigate. It really is intuitive if you kind of have a sense of the framework. That's the key piece. If you understand the basic framework that I just introduced, navigating scoreboard will be relatively easy for you. Well, here's some just some common graphics that we export out of scoreboard or quick score, a speedometer, uh, a quick glance, a bar chart, or a line graph with a trend line. Those kinds of options exist. We also have more sophisticated options we'll be using that can come out of a software tableau or something that we have. But at this stage, scoreboard provides some of the most basic but essential graphics that we can use. Three color traffic light scoring, as you're probably familiar with by now. We can also develop uh, dashboards. This is a sample, uh, has the speedometer with a legend, has a bar chart with a trend line and the data table. But any information that we can get into scoreboard can be incorporated into a sample da or a dashboard. Just one example that we have. So the MetroVision scorecard. But there's a key question, which is, we have a scorecard, now what? So if we, after the heavy lifting that we've, excuse me, that we have done for the MetroVision design, the next phase, the most critical, gets underway. I'm going to take a slight detour and propose, if you will, for a working definition, a performance measure definition. I'll let you read that. Some of the key terms, obviously, underlying comparison, objective evidence over time. And this is really where we have the, the most opportunity, I think, to get better. The performance result we're referring to are the targets we set. 
Of the three parts, the objective evidence is probably the key one that I want to talk about and illustrate. But I'm going to go through a little larger view of this. And this is, again, goes back to the previous presentation in sort of what we call collective impact. Who's heard of collective impact or knows of it? I see a hand in the back or two. Okay. Uh, Brad threw up. Good, Brad, because uh, that's a test question for him. Collective impact is something where organizations who are focused on a common agenda, like our MetroVision plan, who have shared measurement systems, who share measurement information, mutually reinforcing activities, which are our strategic regional and local initiatives, which are innumerable, continuous communication occurring in board meetings and scorecard reports, and then the last, having a backbone organization, which is represented by a convener, Dr. Cog. So we now have everything in place, the conditions in place for collective impact, but there's one key piece that we need to focus on. Does anyone have an idea what that might be? It will be in the measure opportunity for sharing measure data. Currently, uh, I know Brad's group works with some of the jurisdictions, but I think this is really the opportunity where we can more formalize that effort. And they have been, I know his group and others, contact your planning departments and other folks to share information. But this is where if we can do this more deliberately, we can start to bring you better information for decision making. Simply put, that's what this is about. Would that be something you'd be open to, that we could more formally start? I don't know that we need a formal agreement, but certainly an acknowledgement that that's something. And if we have any concerns about it, we want to talk about those as well. But is that something we could, should move forward with and continue on a more formalized, deliberate basis? I see some head nods. Okay. All right. That primarily is the key right there. If we can do that, we will be the central repository for collecting that information and providing it back to you periodically. Okay? What questions or comments would you have? Thank you. Must have been a perfect explanation. <laughs> I should have talked slower. No, no, you shouldn't have. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, so next is agenda item 12, which is under attachment E, the legislative wrap-up with uh, Mr. Morrow. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I thought I'd use this mic. Uh, since Ed's not here, he's got the ner nerve to be in Maine on vacation, I think. Uh, so Jen, is, Jen and I are going to do this. He just climbed the top of Cadillac Mountain today. Yeah. There you go. Now, is Jen going to have to raise the mic when she speaks? Uh -huh. oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> Here. <laughs> um, so, of course, the good news is that the legislative session ended a week ago. The bad news is that there's talk of them coming back, but Jen will talk about that a little bit here in a minute. I was just going to do a quick uh, overview and wrap up and then have Jen t talk about a couple of other specific issues, that and Senate Bill 267. So um, it, was a, it was a good year for Dr. Cog up on the Hill. It was a successful year for us. Um, the, uh, we survived the potential budget cuts and all of that that was being talked about early in the, in the session. Um, and I, and I think ultimately they didn't have to make as many uh, cuts as they thought they were going to have to at the beginning, uh, but that worked out all right. Uh, I think a lot of you know, and we, of course we had conversations here uh, about the, the uh, efforts on transportation that ultimately failed um, and efforts in housing that I guess depending on your perspective uh, were ultimately successful or at least partially successful. Uh, one of the uh, housing related bills that Dr. Cox staff worked on a lot was uh, uh, that rental notice bill that uh, was very helpful, should be helpful for uh, our uh, older adults living in apartments that uh, requires 
uh, in the current law had been uh, only seven weeks notice of rental increases or evictions, seven, uh, seven days, I'm sorry, and this uh, increases it to 21 days, so we're glad to see that that passed actually with uh, a strong bipartisan support. Um, and I'd say the other uh, real successes came in the aging area, particularly in the area of uh, protections for uh, uh, older adults and vulnerable uh, at-risk adults. Uh, we worked in collaboration, in coalition uh, with proponents and, and sponsors for House Bill 1253, which um, provides basically a process for financial advisors and the state uh, commissioner of securities to identify potential incidences of uh, financial exploitation and to even halt transactions if necessary. Um, House Bill 1284, uh, I, th I would describe it as working to cl close a loophole in the background check system. Uh, most providers, uh, including AAAs, that work with older adults and at-risk adults ha do background checks and also have mandatory reporting of potential abuse. But um, there's also potential for people who have substantiated cases of abuse but that never rose to the level of getting into the criminal justice system, but they're in the state's system. And so this bill requires those providers to also do a background check within the state's adult protective services system. So that's an extra measure of protection. Um, I'd say the, you know, from our perspective, because we spent a lot of time on it, the bill we're most proud of success on is, is House Bill 1264. Uh, myself and Jayla and her staff and Ed and Jen spent uh, countless hours dating back to last summer uh, on, on this bill. And this is the one that um, uh, extends the uh, ombudsman program for, for the uh, PACE program to include local ombudsmen. St uh, state ombudsman had been created a year ago. This bill includes local ombudsman now. And we, we got a tiny bit of funding. In the end, there was a big question all session because of what was going on with the budget, with budget whether or not we'd, there'd be any funding uh, for these local ombudsmen. <laughs> it took a heck of a lot of effort, and we finally ended up with enough money f to, for one. <laughs> um, and uh, so we'll be back next year trying to get a, a couple more. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Jen, who will talk about uh, a little bit uh, about Senate Bill 267, because we think there's probably some interest there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I had to, I guess, put a theme on this legislative session, it was really the year of skillful, skillful compromise. Um, we saw a couple of compromise bills, really large compromise bills, one in particular, Senate Bill 267, when the Friday before session ended, a large compromise was hammered out between a couple of rural legislators as well as um, leadership in both the Senate and the House. So it's essentially a, a very large omnibus revenue and spending bill. Um, the title Rural Sustainability Act, um, only a little bit of it has to do with rural sustainability. Um, there's really quite a lot into the bill. But at its core, essentially what the bill does is it creates a Tabor exempt enterprise for the hospital provider fee. So this is one of those mechanisms that's really going to help the state budget, um, kind of the fiscal thicket that we are in in the state budget. Um, but the revenue parts for, for the bill, the main part is that it authorizes the state to engage in um, sale lease agreement, purchase agreements, so that the state is going to sell, sell um, its assets, lease them back. Um, that will happen for the next 20 years, up to $3 billion. Um, those monies that are generated from that, um, some are going to go to capital construction, controlled maintenance, but a good chunk of it is going to transportation. So here's where the big, su supposed to be the big transportation funding fix is in this bill. Um, uh, projected to be about $1.8 billion to go to transportation. Of that, 25% has to go to rural communities and 10% has to be spent on transit. Um, it also requires a 2% reduction in executive branch budget requests that they submit to the governor's office. Now, it's not a required 2% reduction of state agencies, but just a 2% reduction for their budget requests. So it's really up to the discretion of the governor's office whether or not they want to take that 2% reduction into consideration. Uh, the bill also requires doubling the federal medical co uh, Medicaid co-pays um, on prescription drugs and outpatient 
prescription drug and outpatient services, and then it also increases the state sales tax on marijuana to 15%. Currently it was 10% and it was going to decrease this year to 8%. That was jacked up to 15% in this bill as well. The spending part of the bill, um, in the first year it's allocating $30 million to rural and small rural schools and then $20 million to the state education fund. And then it also increases the business personal property tax exemption to eighteen thousand. Um, those are kind of, those are the specifics of the bill. <laughs> I, I was talking to Rich. The general specifics. Uh, the general specifics, yes. I was talking to Rich uh, before the meeting about this bill, and there has been some some chatter going on that this bill violates the single subject rule. Uh, Colorado hasn't seen a bill of this magnitude with so many different moving parts in it for many years. Um, so whether or not anyone could perhaps, or it, whether or not someone does mm -hmm. sue the state over this bill, I think is yet to be seen. But, you know, I, I, as, as I mentioned, this bill was introduced the last four days of session. There were no amendments allowed on the bill and was truly a, a very high-level compromise between both, both um, chambers and, as you can tell, includes, includes quite a lot of of things in it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note, um, as Rich mentioned, there has been some there have been some rumors of a special session that the governor might call. Um, the governor said that this legislative session was one of the most productive, and I would agree with him. Um, there was a lot of things that were done. It was a very cordial session, more than than what we've seen in past uh, past years. And really that has a lot to do with, one, the fact that it's not an election year this year, and then two, we had really strong leadership in both the House and the Senate. Um, the Senate President and the Speaker of the House, polar opposites as it relates to their personalities, attitudes, et cetera. But they were able to come together and, and work together on a lot of different things. Uh, the Governor did, did say, though, his, his main priority for calling a special session is to fund the Energy Office. Um, as well as look at a dedicated funding source for transportation funding and some health care issues. Unfortunately, those issues were all discussed this legislative session, and they're, they're partisan issues. There, could, there, there was not a compromise or any kind of skillful negotiation on any of those issues. So if a special session is called, I'm not sure what is going to be hashed out. Um, you just you have one side saying something and the other side saying something else, and I I just don't think that there can be any agreement to that. Uh, the governor was supposed to announce on Monday whether or not there was going to be a special session. He, uh, that w announcement was delayed. He's been traveling the state on his bill signing tour, um, so I'm not quite sure when we're going to hear. Unless there's some more compromise that's happening, um, you know, it, at, at the Capitol, I'm not sure. That would be the only reason why I would see that that, they, that the governor would call a special session is that there's some sort of compromise that we don't know about that could perhaps be coming. So, I don't know. I don't know if anybody is working on. It. I imagine there might be a few folks that are chatting. Well, so, yeah. Rich, did you have anything else, or I think that's all we have, unless you have any questions or comments. Questions or comments for our lobby team, Director Teeter, please. I thought the best thing that they passed this year was authorizing uh, the switchblade knives. <laughs> <laughs> Director Brockett. I have a question for you. On the, the bill regarding autonomous vehicles, we had a position of oppose unless amended. And I know it was amended, but right. I never got the details on exactly what the amendments were. Maybe you could uh, brief us on that. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think the, the short version of it, that, as I understand the amendments, were that it basically uh, allow, or I don't know if it allows or requires local governments to regulate those vehicles basically the same way they regulate other vehicles, that they can't treat them differently. So you could, you could pass a law that applied to, to both categories, and I that would be fine. I think that's basically it. Is that I, I think a local government can't put any restriction on an autonomous vehicle that the state wouldn't. Because I think the last thing that the, that the state wanted is to have a patchwork of different laws mm -hmm. surrounding autonomous vehicles. Okay. okay. So yeah. And that, that amendment is what got CML to neutral position. Other questions or comments? So ironically at our uh, board meeting this morning for Associated General Contractors, we had our uh, legislative wrap up as well. And it was kind of interesting because the lobbyist said that 
the session exceeded expectations. However, it was tempered by the fact that there were very low expectations this year. <laughs> Yeah, those low expectations come from experience. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the wrap up. Agenda item 13, attachment F, Ms. Sanchez Warren. Good evening. I would like to introduce my partner in crime on this, AJ Diamantopoulos. Diamantopoulos, that's quite the name, huh? Um, he is our, uh, does, he does. Uh, business development for the AAA. Uh, I want to set the stage, and then and then uh, AJ is going to tell you a little bit about an exciting grant that we got. So, remember that Colorado is the third fastest saving state in the nation, right? And that we're going to see a 65 percent growth in the 60 plus population between 2014 and 2024. Sorry, F and B folks, you're going to hear some of the same stuff. Um, and we have a 35% increase in the 90 plus population in that same time frame. Uh, I can guarantee you that no state or federal funding source is going to increase by 65%. Guaranteed. It's not going to happen. So just because the money isn't there doesn't mean the need goes away. So how are we going to keep pace? Um, the demand is out already outpacing the resources that we have. This is rides to the doctor, meals on wheels, um, caregiver support, legal support for older adults, um, in-home services that help people stay in their homes longer. So we, in order to grow that pie, the only place that I can think to grow that pie is to go to the private sector, to work with hospitals and insurance companies and have them start supporting some of these community-based services that they benefit and that their patients benefit from. We've been looking for many ways to do this. Um, and one of the ways is we applied for the Accountable Health Communities Grant. I thought this is an awesome opportunity because it bridges the healthcare world um, with the community health services world and helps make sure that the investment that's made in the hospital system, both money-wise and personnel and, and expertise, is sustained in the community through these community-based services. Well, guess what? We got it. Holy moly, we got it. Um, we're getting a lot of attention. We are getting calls from all across the country about this. Uh, we got a call from this guy, Anish Chopra. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he wanted to meet with us. I'm like, all right. And I'm like, who's Anish Chopra? And, and AJ says, Google him. I'm like, okay. Chief Technology Officer of the United States of America <laughs> under the Obama administration. I'm like, bang, okay, <laughs> let's get our act together. What are we going to say to him? Um, so because we're getting so much attention about this, we thought you should know it about, it, uh, about it as well. So here's AJ. Probably not going to live up to that intro. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Um, so we are very excited about the Accountable Health Communities Grant. It's a uh, five-year opportunity with uh, $4.5 million from uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And Dr. Cog is the bridge organization, and I'll explain what that is in, in just a moment. But <clears throat> if you look at the listing of organizations that got this, there are only 20 nationwide, and they're all uh, health system, health system, university health system, uh, and then the Denver Regional Council of Governments. So we're one of two community-based organizations to receive this award, which is, is very exciting. And the, the one only the, one that includes government, so that's yes, cool. Yes, yes. Thus, uh, Anish Chopra uh, visiting us. So it is designed to lower costs for Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. And I'll, I'll just let you know now that uh, we are the area agency on aging, but for the first time, we'll be working with people uh, uh, from cradle to grave, as they say, people of all ages. So when we first decided to apply for this, I walked around the office asking all the social workers if they, worked, if they had any experience with kids. And they all looked at me, and I, d I don't have any kids, and they all know that. And they're like, well, I have kids. <laughs> but uh, we <laughs> that, that's the extent of it. So we've partnered with uh, agencies across the, the region to uh, address that. But 
Uh, our overall goal is to improve patient outcomes and, and most importantly, streamline the referral of patients to community organizations. There is a process uh, that already exists. When you go to the doctor, uh, sometimes you'll be asked uh, by a social worker if you need help with anything. Um, and if you say yes, they might refer you to an organization like ours or like uh, uh, um, Jewish Family Services. Um, that is a very unstructured uh, and, in my opinion, unproductive use of time because it's not a formal referral and it, it's not as effective as it could be. Um, and so as we streamline that process, we're also going to gather data on five areas. Um, some call them the social determinants of health and some call them health-related social needs. The people who call them health-related social needs are the ones giving us the money, so that's, that's what we'll be calling them for, <laughs> for the next five years. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, as I said, to, to integrate and align the screening and referral of Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries from clinical care to community care, community care is our primary goal. Our secondary goal is to reduce total health care costs and um, improve outcomes for community dwelling beneficiaries. Meaning Another CMS people. title. <laughs> uh, we, we call them people. Um, uh, by, uh, by 2022, uh, April 30th to be exact. Uh, we don't plan to stop on April 30th, 2022, uh, but that's when uh, CMS will stop giving us money for it, so we'll, we'll pursue alternative strategies five years from now. Um, to apply for this, we built a very robust consortium of partners. They uh, include clinical partners, community providers, and behavioral health partners. Uh, a lot of uh, the community health providers you'll recognize from the Area Agency on Aging Contractors. Um, we've uh, worked with them uh, extensively, and, uh, but we're going to have to add other organizations to address the needs across the whole area. Our clinical partners we're very excited about. Uh, Centura Health has partnered with us with four of their hospitals in the region, uh, St. Anthony's, St. Anthony's North, uh, Littleton Adventist Hospital, and uh, Porter Adventist Hospital. Um, Denver Health has partnered with us uh, with the Sam Sandoz Westside Pediatric Clinic. Um, and the Metro Community Provider Network is a uh, network of what they call federally qualified health centers. It's basically primary care, but they operate under a special designation to receive extra funding to work with uh, uh, low-income disadvantaged people primarily. Um, and then our behavioral health partners, again, you'll recognize the Jefferson Center for Mental Health, and uh, the, we've also partnered with the Aurora Center for Mental Health and the Excelsior Youth Center. That is, uh, and again, a CMS where our consortium, it, it sounds very fancy, so I'll, I'll be using it a lot. Um, and we'll be adding, again, other community providers to help address the need. And the five areas we will be testing are housing, food insecurity, utility needs, interpersonal violence, and transportation needs. Now, I don't want to get your hopes up. We're not going to be solving any housing issues on the macro level, <laughs> but we will be working with people on um, housing insecurity and housing quality. And that's uh, services like uh, what we do already, installing grab bars to prevent falls, uh, helping people clean so that they, again, prevent falls. Uh, other Building like ramps. That. Building ramps, yeah. um, uh, things like that. Um, interpersonal violence, uh, we'll be working with uh, uh, our clinic partners um, and uh, the Colorado Coalition Against Domestic Violence to uh, refer people who uh, report that they are uh, victims or around uh, domestic violence. We will also work with uh, victims of child abuse and elder abuse. Um, and there, the, the data reporting gets a little iffy because the, the information is confidential, so we won't be... Um, we won't be doing uh, much with that. And then again, transportation needs. And again, this is across the lifespan, so it's not just Seniors Resource Center providing rides to, to people 60 and over. It's going to be people on um, what they call NEMT, non-emergent medical transport, which uh, uh, Matt Helfant can t teach you all about, um, <laughs> uh, and, and other providers uh, for younger people. Um, this is a five-year uh, project, but it comes with a one-year startup period. So we began May 1st, so uh, 15 days ago. 
we're getting ourselves organized. This is a large endeavor. It's, it's never been done before. I talked with our project officer at CMS, and they're excited, but they're Center very... Center for Medicaid and Medicare. Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I apologize. I'm just a translator. They, they do make fun <laughs> of me around here for my acronyms. Um, sometimes they think I'm speaking English, but sometimes they're not sure. <laughs> um, and uh, so we're getting ready. We're, there's a lot of operational work we have to do. Um, MCPN has 17 clinics, and so we have to work with all 17 to figure out how we're going to screen these people, um, how we're going to refer them, and then how we're going to design uh, a quality improvement plan to help streamline the whole process. But in years two through five, so May of 2018 is year two, we will screen a minimum of 75,000 Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, and we will provide navigation services uh, to a minimum of 3,000 people. We're going to track the data and provide reports. And uh, uh, as, as the people agree to uh, navigation services, we will develop a care plan and make referrals for, for each person. And the, excuse me? So navigation services is we are being provided a screening um, a series of questions from CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, to determine if you have uh, a need in one of the five areas. If you say yes, uh, a clinical or a community-based navigator will develop a plan. How are we going to address these needs? A social worker. A social worker. Um, and, then, and then they will help carry it out. And then the, the most exciting part for our clinical and our community providers is that uh, we're going to be closing the loop, uh, is the terminology we've been using. For the first time, community providers will report back to the clinicians that Yes, they've begun, uh, they've begun Meals on Wheels on June 15th, and they are proceeding for the next uh, five weeks, and then we'll uh, assess that later. Um, that's very exciting because a lot of clinicians are very hesitant to ask somebody if they're food insecure when they know they don't have a resource to provide if they say yes. Um, so that's, that's, again, very exciting. And then we will be uh, implementing a quality improvement plan at the clinic level, um, at the consortium level, and, uh, and we're working with uh, some other awardees. Uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Health Plans in, in uh, Grand Junction uh, also was awarded a track three, and we'll be uh, working with them at a, a, a distant level. It's not a big integration there. Um, the data flow is the uh, exciting part for a lot of people after the navigation services. We have a responsibility to report to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid all of the uh, data we gather on when people were screened, uh, what needs they, want, they uh, screened as in need of, and uh, then we're going to report their Medicaid and or Medicare number to CMS who will then uh, use the claims data they receive uh, at the federal level to uh, calculate the uh, benefit, the financial benefit of these services. That is incredibly exciting. Um, we're also going to uh, do this at the regional level. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid are very famous for providing uh, national reports. Uh, which will benefit us, but it will benefit us even more if we have all the data flowing to us so that we can then analyze it uh, as, as our community here. That is no small undertaking, and I make no promises, but we're going to work on, on aggregating all of that data together. Um, for any of you who have worked with Jerry at all, something like this will look familiar, even though he didn't work on this. This is our driver diagram. This is how we plan on changing things over the next five years. I won't go into all the detail. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> although I could talk slower no. No. <laughs> in a North Carolina accent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could upset him in talking in a South Carolina accent. Um, but, uh, and this will adjust over time as we work with our, um, all the consortium members will form an advisory board to inform our quality improvement initiatives. Um, and we will adjust this as we identify areas for change. Um, but it is our theory and plan for change. All right. Questions Any or comments? questions? Director Shakti. So um, one of the things we talk about is if people stay in their homes, it costs a whole lot less. If they go to a nursing home, it costs a whole lot more. They would be able to track if something we, that 
it's one of these plans helps people stay in their homes as opposed to going to a nursing home, that savings would be tracked here. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so exciting. Yeah. Um, because, you know, all the time we have these anecdotal stories, we don't have the data, we don't have the evidence. And so when people come to say to us, they say, prove it, we, we really haven't been able to. And this gives us the data that we need so desperately to prove that community-based services like transportation and, and, and nutrition services and all those other ones that I talked about save the system money. We know it does. We see it all the time, but we need the proof, and this provides the proof. And I'll, I'll add to that that um, uh, everybody in the health policy world knows that community-based services impact the cost of health care and quality outcomes. Nobody has been able to date to figure out that number or, or how. So this is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, doing that. We're going to have that information. Uh, I, we will hopefully have that information. I don't want to speak in, in declarations here, but uh, we, this is our best effort at it. Director Sullivan. I just had a question. So um, this is really exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious. So there's um, so many patients that if there were was a particular service or coverage under Medicare for a particular um, service in a particular site of care that's less expensive, we often see they don't have access to it. Are right. you going to be able to capture the, the gaps that yeah. exist so in this data as well ahead. as the successes? And we have to do a gap analysis as yeah, well. Yeah, so every year uh, we'll be doing a, well, an annual gap analysis uh, <laughs> to <laughs> determine uh, where, uh, where in our region the gaps exist on the community side, and that might be geographic and it might be monetary. Will and you be able to tell Medicare where their gaps are? Uh, <laughs> we will uh, give it a try. We will attempt, but what's more important is that we'll be able to take it to the Colorado legislature and make our lobbyists and Rich's job a whole lot easier because we yes. will have proof. And we could say, in this area, so we know that providing transportation and nutrition services um, saved the, the government this amount of money. We have a gap in this area of our region, we need to expand it. We need X amount of money to do that. We're a whole lot more likely to get funding for that than we would, um, you know, without that data. And, and if we can show cost savings to Medicaid, they're really going to be interested in that because Medicaid is this, you know, skyrocketing expense that impacts everything we do here in this room, um, has implications for everything. So it's going to be a really good way to show um, ways to, 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 to reduce health care costs. And I'll, I'll add, uh, the RAND Corporation did a study of um, what are called OECD countries, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, it's 35 countries, uh, and this is as specific as they've gotten with this type of analysis. Uh, but they found, and it's, it's the developed world, basically, but they found that for every 1% increase in an annual budget of a country uh, for uh, social services, every uh, man, woman, and child's uh, life expectancy increases by an average of 18 days. So there is this body of knowledge, but there's no specifics out there, and we're hoping to determine some of the specifics. Director Cernanek. Yes, thank you, AJ and Jayla. Um, what I consider to be really exciting, this is not a question, it's more a statement of support around this and why folks should be excited. Um, one is uh, everyone here knows that uh, if you provide a mentor for youth or a coach for someone around their physical health, um, they tend to be a little more accountable and it becomes easier because they're helping along the way. And um, AJ, of course, has talked about this as being a, a huge leap of complexity uh, that the AAA is, is taking on. But I will say that AJ was involved with the readmission reduction program and working with hospitals that involved a lot of the same principles, not necessarily at the same scale. And so what's really exciting is the expansion across the age spectrum, but using in my opinion, a lot of the same principles of community-based services to 
eliminate some of those gaps and remind folks and actually monitor folks with regard their adherence to the plan. Uh, if anyone has a loved one that might have had long-term care insurance, and maybe part of that is the development of a managed care plan uh, that's in conjunction with this. This is something that's very similar, uh, but what it does is instead of just pointing folks to private folks and saying it's up to the family to follow, uh, this one has a, a lot more follow through and a lot more tracking that's there. Uh, and if I asked uh, who in this room is a taxpayer, we might have close to unanimity uh, <laughs> uh, in that, and uh, reducing uh, and finding ways to reduce uh, the the increasing costs in Medicaid, as Jayla has mentioned, um, because it is going to bankrupt our country uh, in the way that we're going if we don't find some of the solutions around this, and um, that's why CMMS is is very interested. Uh, in this and have some motivation because uh, they actually see that. Um, the folks that are legislatures out there are still, in my opinion at this point in time, a little naive relative to this cost growth. And so as many of the board members around here are knowledgeable of depreciation of the capital assets related to transportation, in my opinion, that level of cost that is underfunded, it pales in comparison to the health care costs or the health care needs and the cost of those needs going forward uh, as we look at the demographics in the, in the United States. And um, folks might be amazed to know that uh, longevity in the United States is actually decreased for the first time. Uh, and AJ statistics from the RAND study says uh, we need to be looking at social services and community services and it's getting folks to the point where they may feel responsible but we got a complex system in where folks need to go for these things and what this does is it takes a lot of logic, a lot of good sense and what we're going to be able to do is actually track some of that and maybe be able to actually nudge it in the right direction. And uh, I applaud AJ and the AAA staff and Jayla uh, for making this coup in this. This is the largest grant uh, that has been received by the AAA. And, we're and Dr. Cog, by the way. And Dr. Cog. And so we are really, Just really, saying. really. <laughs> Jayla's, Jayla's not competitive. <laughs> at all, at all on this. So uh, we're really excited about it and I just wanted to comment because this is something that's really important and can be beneficial for not just our community but a lot of others as we set some of that example. And that leads me into you guys have an awesome, awesome staff in the AAA and three of them are here. Can you guys stand up? Katie, who's an ombudsman, Bree, who's an ombudsman, Yolanda, who works in the Veterans Directed Home and Community Based Services Program. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, agenda item 14, which is attachment G. It has Mr. Rieger's name on it. However, um, I was told that he would just basically be introducing Mr. Van Meter. So. We'll just bring up Mr. Van Meter. <laughs> no. uh, Thank that's, you, Jake. That's Jacob, a.k.a. Vanna. Exactly. <laughs> and Chair. So that introduction gives you a sense as to the topic. I am here to provide the annual status report on the Fast Tracks program. That's something I'm also asked to do on a yearly basis, just as the Accountable Health Communities grant folks will be providing an annual gap analysis on a yearly basis. Um, we have a correspondence and supporting documentation that was provided in the board package this evening. It starts with an articulation of the projects that were included in the Fast Tracks plan, 
that have been implemented and opened along with their opening date in the interest of time. I won't read that list for you. Uh, but I will go into a little bit of detail on a few projects that were current that are currently in process underway and um, some information that was not we weren't able to put into this report because of the timing and some so some current updates is what I'm trying to say. In addition to those seven projects that are open, we also have the North Metro Rail Line from DUS to 124th and the Southeast Rail Extension under construction as this body is very well aware. The Southeast Rail Extension project does have a federal grant attached to it, $92 million. Construction um, commenced in May of last year and is well underway. Now, the day after we s I signed this report to Dr. Cog and we submitted it, we reported to our board of directors that very next day, May 2nd, a status update on the N line or the North Metro line. So I want to address, just address that right now. And rather than free form, I will read for you the prepared statement from our PI people on this um, project. Yeah, sorry. It's one paragraph. It'll go quickly. The N line schedule has been impacted primarily due to time necessary to complete, review, and receive approval of the overall design drawings. RTD and regional rail partners, our RP, our contractor, are working together to determine a realistic time frame for project completion. As a new schedule is determined, RTD and R RP, regional rail partners, will also determine any steps that can be taken to save time in the schedule. In spite of the construction delay, significant progress on the North Metro rail line is ongoing and we will update Dr. Cog as more information becomes available. So what I'm referring to or addressing, hopefully most folks know this, but uh, it just dawned on me as I was reading that. We were reporting to our board the day after this correspondence to you that there are delays in the delivery of the North Metro rail line, the N line. And so that's what that um, spiel that I just provided you was meant to address. We are working cooperatively with our contractor to try to get as close to back on schedule as possible. And as I noted, we will report progress as we move along. Regarding the gold line, the G line from Denver Union Station to Arvada and Wheat Ridge, which is part of the Eagle Project and the one part that has not opened yet, construction is complete with only a few punch list items remaining. Testing is the next step. And not long after I signed this correspondence to the Board of Directors, we did receive approval from the Federal Railroad Administration to begin limited testing on the G line. So that is a big milestone for us. We've been waiting for quite a while since last fall for that. RTD and our contractors on that project, Denver Transit Partners, are working with the Public Utilities Commission, Colorado Public Utilities Commission, to select a start date for, te for testing. And again, we'll let the Dr. Cog Board of Directors know when we reach that milestone for the limited testing on the G line. On the University of Colorado A line, the Federal Railroad Administration waiver is still in effect. It was extended through July 30th as reported in my correspondence dated May 1st. We still have flaggers at all of the accurate crossings. It is still operating safely and we are working with both the Federal Railroad Administration and Public Utilities Commission um, to get out from under that waiver and to full regular ownership and operation. Good news on the University of Colorado A-Line. In April, just last month, we operated at a 95.6% on-time performance for that line. So. Our early startup problems substantially have been resolved, although there was uh, an incident within the past week that made the press and um, will impact our on-time performance a bit in May, but it's improving quite 
strongly and dramatically. The report also gives a fast tracks program cost update through the year 2019. I will note we had a question from Dr. Cog's staff regarding the costs depicted in for the Northwest Rail Corridor. You can see on the Northwest Rail Corridor to date we have spent 11.1 million dollars. That's primarily an environmental and preliminary design work and that's the Northwest Rail Corridor completion from the current terminus in Westminster to Longmont. You can see we have programmed a total budget of $28 million. That other $17 million is the amount that was dedicated out of RTD's savings from the Eagle Project a number of years ago for the Longmont Station construction. And that um, money still remains as a commitment and in the RTD budget for fast tracks in the near term. And we're working closely with City of Longmont staff to progress that project. There are, as folks are aware around this table, in addition to the Northwest Rail Corridor completion from Westminster to Longmont, there's also the North Metro Rail Line completion north of 124th, as well as the Central Rail Extension from the current Central Rail Line Extension, 30th and Downing to 38th and Blake, as well as the Southwest Rail Extension projects, all which currently do not have funding identified in the near term, nor through, frankly, the 2040 time horizon. We have staff and stakeholders working cooperatively on all of those projects, and I'd be happy to answer any specific questions regarding what I've just reported. Director that, Coast. I think, is the end of my report, Chair. Oh. Director Atchison. Bill, can you give us an update? Uh, there was an announcement made, and we've had some discussion around the two stations on the goal line being picked up by the B line. We had made the uh, announcement of when that would start. Then we had an announcement that it's not going to start. What's the latest? Yeah, so to set that or reset that context, there are, as... Director Atchison um, just articulated two intermediate stops along the B-Line service. The B-Line service is the operation be that we are currently operating, part of the Eagle project between Denver Union Station and Westminster. There are two intermediate stations. They are for 41st and Fox and Pecos Junction. Those stations were constructed as part of the G-Line which shares track through Pecos Junction and then heads west project. It has been RTD's plan and intent to service those two stations with the G-Line operations. When the G-Line was opening was delayed, we heard from citizens and stakeholders in the neighborhoods near those two stations requesting that we consider having the B-Line service, which currently operates nonstop between Denver Union Station and Westminster, start stopping and servicing those two stations. We held public hearings and moved forward with a plan to have the, that service start stopping and servicing those two stations with our May run board later this month. We change our services, adjust them typically three times a year, and May was our next opportunity to do that. Concurrently with the public process around that, we also were working with our concessionaire, Denver Transit Partners, to negotiate um, the agreement and the changes to our um, current contract that would allow us to start operating that service. We have not reached the point yet where we've gone through all the contractual requirements necessary to allow us to do that. We don't have agreement with the contractor, frankly, on all the terms and conditions and changes required for that. So we are not opening, or that service will remain, we're not opening those two stations for service along the B line in May. Right now, I think our anticipation and stay tuned because it's still subject to further negotiations and the G-Line opening, is that we would start 
stopping at those stations with both the G line, the gold line services, as well as the B line services upon the opening of the G line, likely not before then. Very long-winded answer, but I wanted to paint the picture so that hopefully most people could follow what I was describing. Director Pfeiffer. So the plan is to have the B and the G continue the plan to B and G to both stop at those stations? Is there that type of demand? That is the direction that we're going right now. But is that is there demand for two lines? Is, is there demand enough for two lines? Two lines to draw, stop at two stops. My, my fear is, is right. riding the W line to get to the airport took forever for all the stops. And if you want people to really do it, we got to make sure that we're not just putting lines in to Right. to stop and, and add further delay in the commute. So that has always been part of the G-Line plan from day one. It's part and required for all G-Line services to stop at both of those stations on all trips as part of our, the B -line our federal requirements. Right. For the B-Line, the current scheduled trip time is 11 minutes between Westminster and Denver Union Station. It's a pretty quick trip. By adding these two stations, we will be adding two to three minutes. So it will go um, to 13, 14 minutes each way, uh, which really should not negatively impact ridership very much. And in fact, the improved service of having more trips serve those two stations and the possibility and capability for passengers to go in both directions on both lines we believe will increase ridership more than that slight time impact will impact ridership. Okay, in the queue I have uh, Henry, Montoya, and Atchison. Director Henry. First of all, Director Pfeiffer, be careful with those dots. Some of them are in Adams County that you want to get rid of. Just saying. <laughs> Not trying to get rid of the stop. Uh -huh. what I'm I just don't to, want him to stop. <laughs> well, I, I mean, have you ridden the W line all the way to, uh, to, and switch it? To the I, I would. I'd be thrilled if I could have a line anywhere near my house. <laughs> um, just to, to express, I'm sitting here with Thornton, Federal Heights, Commerce City, Adams County, and uh, North Glen would have been here, but he said he double booked himself. I wanted just to express my disappointment in RTD in regards to the North line. Um, I feel like someone has actually dug a hole or contractors dug a hole in my basement, left the house and refuses to call me back. Um, any idea of when we're going to get a date uh, on when it will be finished? I do not have a good idea on a date as to when that end will be. Um, We've been working with the contractor for a long time. They are still out in the field making substantial progress, but a, an answer is, I suspect, at least weeks away. You will be hearing about it. Weeks are better than years. Yes. I've been working on this for 10 years, so weeks are better than years. If, you know, if I can get an end, end date by the end of the year, I'd be thrilled. Understood. We, we should have this resolved well before then in terms of the issues and the impact of schedule. Great. Thank you. The Director Montoya. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, as Director Henry just stated, it's, the end line has been pretty frustrating. For, it, as, for those of you who don't know, it goes right through the heart of uh, Thornton. And, you know, we've, we're asking our citizens in East Lake, which is a historic little town, to accommodate the end of the line, um, which is not supposed to be the end of the line. It's supposed to go up to Highway 7. So, you know, anytime I have a town hall meeting, I have residents show up from East Lake all the way down to the su southern part of the city. Um, it turns into a two-hour complaint fest about RTD. And, um, you know, I'm there to talk about the services the city provides, and all we, we just can't get around the RTD issue. And so, you know, I, I need to come back to my constituents and be able to answer some questions for them. They, like Commissioner Henry said, we need to know a, a deadline or a date. And second thing we'd like to know is, um, well, we're, we're hearing rumors, I should say, and that if the RRP and RTD can't come to terms or can't come to agreement, that potentially the end of the or this line might stop at the National Western Stock Show. I don't know if you've heard that or if that's, there's any truth to that. 
But I, I've been getting a lot of calls about that lately. Yeah, I don't know where that rumor is coming from. There is no. Nothing I'm not aware of anything like aware. that. That's not under discussion, under consideration. It's not been raised to my attention or our board's attention, at least publicly as far as I know. And I, no. Okay. Well, if you can keep your eyes open on that issue and right. um, let us know if something yeah. changes on that. But uh, again, I just want to frustrate or ex express my frustration right. as well on that. So thank you. Director Atchison. Yeah, one of the things that that we have been talking to RTD about is the fact that this proposed new stop on the B line allows people to get off at those two stations and get on the G line to go out to the Jeffco area without having to go all the way to Denver Union Station. So this is an advantage that is could be a very much a service improvement once it's done. Uh, but right now, I think we're all seeing some of the frustration of seeing two stations sitting there parking facilities and everything ready to go, but because of the holdup we've had, which is resulting from the A-line, it's affecting everything else starting to get to move forward on lines that are, are near completion. And with the move of the FRA to allow testing to start, even though it's limited testing, if we can get them and the contractors to agree, that we can still get some service changes where people can open up two additional stations, get more riders using the system, and get more people into the revenue streams of RTD. Director Stolzman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so first I just want to say thank you, Mr. Van Meter. I think you have an unenviable job. <laughs> um, I just want to remind everyone that we're all part of RTD. It, it is very frustrating. It's very frustrating, I'm sure, for the directors and for the staff members that the project simply doesn't have enough funding and we all would like to be able to accomplish more. We're all in the, in the same boat and so I personally think we need to focus on ways to make RTD be more successful. Um, there are a lot of shortfalls and we, we can all recognize them. I think RTD has openly recognized them. So I think we need to be eyes up about this when we look at our TIP funding. There's simply not enough funding to do the projects that they have on their plate and the projects that we all expect them to do. And I think we need to come together and think about ways to fix that. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Finn Meter. Appreciate it. Thank you. So agenda item 15 is committee reports. And we're going to start with the stack. Director Jones. My very able-bodied alternate attended the stack. So I will turn it over to Roger. Very good. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, Doug Rex was in attendance also. Doug gave me notes. Thank you, Doug. I will just repeat these notes. So regarding safety, and particularly for fatalities and serious injuries, CDOT staff presented on federal requirements and efforts to establish performance measures and targets addressing several aspects. So it was a very good presentation on there because certainly there's been a large number of fatalities this year uh, in motor vehicle and motorcycles. They did a great job. Staff also provided an update on proposed changes to future year funding distribution for the FTA 5311 program. These are funds that transit, capital, and operations support in rural areas mostly. So the proposed, or technically all rural for it is all for rural areas. The proposed changes address equitable funding distribution concerns statewide. And then just on a note, there was somewhat of a little bit of a robust discussion regarding the uh, the project list. And it was just the, the, the advice and some saying, you know, RTD can consider consulting more with the stack. I think RTD is certain, or excuse me, CDOT has certainly done a good job coming up with a list. It's not an easy process. So I think they, they did a good job answering and recognizing it's not an easy list to come up with and everybody has a project. That's the report. Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Atchison. Yeah, from the Metro Mayor's piece, we, we are still working on a number of issues left over from the legislature. Uh, as Jen reported earlier, we did get a bill through on construction litigation, although it's a very small piece of what was in 156. The governor has postponed the signing of that bill twice. Uh, we're now looking at May 23rd, and this is just, I think it's his traveling around doing bill signings all over the state. 
1242, which was a transportation bill, which failed at the Senate Finance Committee on a 3-2 vote. Uh, the Impact 64 group, Metro Mayors, Dr. Cog, RTD, CDOT, everybody is still talking about which of the three potential bill titles will be pulled forward by CCA. Will it come in 2017 or 2018 because of the cost and time of getting petitions out? Uh, that discussion is still ongoing. And also in transportation-wise, the mobility choice piece, RTD did vote to go back to support that. There is a meeting on Friday with that group of stakeholders to discuss next steps. And all of that is being supported also through Metro Mayors. County Commissioners, Director Partridge. I have to say I was not in attendance at this meeting, and I don't think we have anybody in here that's attending. But it was on affordable housing in Denver, presented a program, did a wonderful job on ideas and programs for affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, Director Cernanek. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, in addition to what you heard from AJ and uh, Jayla earlier this evening, uh, the Advisory Committee did meet on April 21st, and uh, there were a number of topics that were covered. Uh, one is uh, with regard to Sunshine Home Sharing, uh, which is um, kind of a matchmaking group for folks that uh, want to share a living space, one that might be an owner and one that is willing to uh, trade some level of labor and support uh, for that. And so it is one of those items that can uh, provide for um, cohabitation uh, in a, a way that uh, will allow folks to possibly stay in the community longer. Um, what is interesting about this is some of us, including Littleton, uh, have some restrictions with regard to unrelated adults living in the same single family residence and uh, causing us, some of us, to um, re examine what we have and what it might be doing to place challenges in this regard without. Uh, necessarily supporting, and I'm going to use probably a politically incorrect piece, which is avoiding the frat houses in our neighborhoods as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Brad and others provided a boomer bond assessment update. Uh, this is a tool that's available to communities to test readiness uh, for dealing with uh, seniors and senior issues within the communities. Uh, most of the counties have gone through that, and in addition to that, a number of local municipalities have. Um, one of the learnings that has occurred is it's challenging to go through the assessment as well as what implementation might be indicated off of that when someone is from a smaller community and um, there are some grants that have been provided to uh, help Brad and others help those smaller communities not only go through the assessment but possibly get involved in collaboratively having programs that can support seniors. Uh, in addition to uh, that, um, Kelly Roberts uh, from the AAA staff provided an update on the regional commissions on uh, the county commissions on aging forum uh, that was held. Um, in addition to the AAA, Douglas County helped to host that. A uh, big effort in uh, taking a look not just at legislative advocacy, uh, which is always interesting, but also uh, idea and program sharing uh, from Council on Aging to Councils on Aging and taking a look at some of the best practices. Uh, if you're looking for a copy of the report, it's attached to the latest ACA minutes. Uh, in the director's report, and uh, you heard her uh, command of some of the statistics at the federal budget level. Uh, Jayla provided uh, uh, what is happening with regard to the federal budget and dealing with support for seniors that is coming out of that. Um, and uh, many of us know that the federal budget is dominated by defense, social security, and then major health programs. Um, and then uh, what does that leave for some items that might be focused on helping seniors stay in our community. Uh, Amy Pulley from the, uh, the staff also provided an update with regard to the community transitions and case management area. Uh, community transitions 
is a program that has a very long waiting list and what it is, is is folks that are in facilities that might be able to live independently in the community. Uh, biggest challenge, uh, and you've heard it mentioned more than once here, is affordable housing for seniors. And um, uh, the other part uh, to know in that, uh, in addition to what AJ talked about earlier this evening, uh, is that the AAA has also embarked on uh, programs, joint programs, in working with veterans. And uh, it gives me goosebumps just thinking about what uh, what we are all involved in, um, whether you're seeing it as closely as, as some of the rest of us. And uh, as we quickly reported at uh, last, last month's meeting, uh, the Finance Committee uh, presented to the Finance and Budget Subcommittee of the Dr. Cog Board. And um, the 2017 to 2019 contracts are, are going out now. Um, the constraint uh, at this point in time is what we know from state funding, and the unknown is what might be coming from the federal side, so uh, continue to pay attention. Um, we did have uh, two organizations, one in Adams County and one in Arapahoe County, uh, that did not uh, fully spend their money, and uh, those dollars have been reallocated. Uh, and of course, the concern is uh, when we issue a contract and a contractor, um, and although one of these is through the county, uh, is not able to fully execute on that. Uh, but then looking at in the areas of transportation, uh, Jayla and others are involved in, in trying to be creative, uh, expanding possibly on what is happening in the city of Centennial, uh, possibly using vouchers for senior transportation rather than trying to set up a system so that um, shared car approaches might be there. And then as uh, AJ reported, the $4.51 million uh, grant in the Accountable Health Communities grant uh, is the largest grant that Dr. Cog has received. And um, of course, um, uh, Jayla has laid down the gauntlet uh, with Mr. Rex to see what can be done in the transportation side. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. The uh, Regional Air Quality Council, Shakti, Director Shakti. I don't believe we've met since the last meeting. Mis Mr. Rex. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, just real quick, I don't want to belabor, but I, um, you know, we, we have Good representation on rack on the rack now. We have Director Shakti Jones, Atchison, uh, Mayor Malay also serves on there. Um, Chairman Roth, as well as myself, were recently appointed to the rack as well. So uh, I just wanted to share that that, that just happened in the last couple of weeks. E470, Director Rakowski. I'll be very very brief. We had a audit which had absolutely no comments. Uh, from the auditors, it was a very clean audit. Yeah, good. And I have an item under other items, other matters for a very short period. Okay. Mr. Van Meter, have you done everything you want to do? Well, I have another 15 or 20 minutes, but <laughs> just in the interest of time, I think we're done. Very good. Uh, Director Rakowski. In 1962, President Kennedy signed legislation making May 15th Peace, a National Memorial Peace Officer Day. The FBI has just recently released figures that the felonious death of law enforcement officers is more than doubled from last year. This is National Police Week. I suggest you take a moment and thank a sheriff's deputy, a police officer, for what they do because civilization has only exists from people that are trying to control the animal instincts of those in our community, which unfortunately seem to be growing. So with that, I, if you would like to thank a police officer, you can start with the young man up in the corner right now. Thank you very much. Any other, uh, anything else for the good of the cause? With that, at 8.28, we are adjourned.